Good morning. As presiding officer, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament for the 15th Business in the Parliament conference. To those of you who joined us for dinner last night, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the evening. And to those of you who are joining us this morning, a very warm welcome to your Scottish Parliament. It's really great to be able to welcome you all here in person for the first time since 2019. And there's another first. This is the first hybrid Business in the Parliament conference. So a very warm welcome to those who are joining us online. As you will know, Business in the Parliament is a unique opportunity for business representatives from all over Scotland to participate in debate and discussions with politicians and policymakers on issues that are of importance to you, our business community. And before I introduce our first speaker, I would just like to suggest that you feel free to tag, tweet, post, blog, vlog, poke, star, click, <laughs> like, friend, favourite, I don't know what half of these are either, um, <laughs> or otherwise engage through social media. And the hashtag is BIPC2023. But please, of course, set your devices to silent. I'm very grateful to the members and staff of the Economy and Fair Work Committee and to our own events team for their hard work in delivering this event once again. And of course, this conference is a joint initiative of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. So I'd very much like to thank the Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers and their officials in the Scottish Government for their contribution. The conference began in 2004 with the aim of bringing business and the Parliament together, and that remains the purpose. And as I mentioned last night, the theme of this year's conference is sustainable recovery, maximising the opportunities of the next decade. And that's a theme that's been considered by many parliamentary committees this session, as they, together with our conveners group, grapple with how best to consider the major cross-cutting challenges that we all face, such as recovery from COVID and the response to the twin climate and biodiversity emergencies. And the Economy and Fair Work Committee has a leading role in this, and I will shortly introduce Claire Baker, MSP, who is convener of the committee. And Claire will provide an outline of the committee's work in relation to sustainability. And we will also hear from guest speakers on the subject, including Andrew Murphy, the Chief Operating Officer for John Lewis Partnership, and the First Minister, the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. But there will be an opportunity for you too to put your questions to our speakers this morning. And there will also be six workshops on themes linking with sustainability. And this will give you the opportunity to debate and raise any issues that are important to you. And on your return to the Chamber, we will have a cross-party panel of MSPs. And again, this is your opportunity to put questions on the issues that matter to you. And the conference will close with an address from John Swinney, MSP, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery and currently also Interim Finance and Economy Minister. As you can see, there's a lot to get through this morning. And this is very much a listening event for us politicians. We want to hear from you, so please make the most of this opportunity. Participate. Let's hear your voices. We're very, very keen to do so. I hope you have a, a worthwhile, thought-provoking and fulfilling time at Business in the Parliament. Most importantly, I hope you enjoy it, because your engagement with us here at the Parliament is incredibly important. I would now like to invite Claire Baker, MSP, convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, to open this morning's proceedings. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, uh, President Officer, and good morning, President Officer, uh, First Minister, MSP colleagues and invited guests. It is my pleasure to be here in my capacity as convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee and to open this morning's conference. I am pleased to see so many of you in Parliament and it's fantastic to be meeting here in person as well as online, ready to discuss the issues that matter to Scotland's business community. Many of you will have engaged with the Economy and Fair Work Committee this session or perhaps one of its predecessors. For those who haven't yet, and I would encourage you to uh, participate and then join in with our work, uh, I'll briefly outline some of the work we have undertaken um, so far in this session and give an insight to some of our future projects. So a key role for all committees is to scrutinise the work of the Scottish Government, to conduct inquiries and to hold government to account. 
The Economy and Fair Work Committee remit does cover a broad spectrum of policies, but the theme of ensuring a sustainable recovery from COVID and other economic shocks and the policies and actions needed to maximise opportunities for the next decade underlie all of the Committee's work. So beginning our work in 2021, the Committee recognised emerging issues across a number of sectors and undertook an inquiry into Scotland's supply chains. We looked at the challenges and shifts impacting our economy and how sustainable resilience for Scottish businesses could be supported and opportunities seized. We know that the supply of labour is causing a major problem, acute problems in some sectors. We need to see greater flexibility with the occupational shortage list and temporary visas. And the UK and Scottish governments, that does sound better to me as well, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, I don't have my voice projected enough. I'll just, I'll not go over everything, but just to say it is fantastic to see everyone in Parliament, as well as those joining us online. It has been a number of years where we haven't had this kind of event. So it is the MSPs really welcome that people come across Scotland and come from their constituency to participate. Um, I'm just outlining some of the work the committee's undertaken and we've done a supply chain inquiry. Uh, so we also welcome the Scottish Government's 10-year economic strategy for economic transformation and its focus on growing entrepreneurship um, and the focus on Scotland's labour supply issues and addressing economic inactivity. We do need to see a roadmap to show how Scotland will ensure that labour force uh, skills are planned, developed, maintained and retained. So a key consideration for us all is the transition to net zero and providing certainty that businesses need in terms of the support that will be available to them and the solutions and technologies that will be promoted. The committee has also taken, uh, undertaken an inquiry into retail sector and town centres. We know how important retail is for Scotland's economy and the significant change the sector is experiencing, some of it hastened by the pandemic. In particular, the smaller independent retail sector in Scotland is playing an increasingly important role, but we know that they are coming under intense pressure from energy costs and other rising costs. Across Scotland's communities, there are many valued local businesses, but too often they now sit alongside big empty retail units. The committee valued businesses in sorry, the committee valued visiting businesses in Hamilton, Fraserburgh, Inverurie and Burnt Island and exploring models such as the mid steeple Quarter in Dumfries, hearing about how local centres can be supported and revitalised. The Scottish Government's policy refresh will hopefully bring renewed focus on retail in our town centres. With so many interlinked strategies and initiatives, we need to see leadership, policy cohesion and a shared direction of travel across all government portfolios and this will be vital. And the establishment of the Retail Industry Leadership Group is a positive step, and I know it's jointly shared by Andrew Murphy, the John Lewis Partnership Chief Operating Officer, who I look forward to hearing from shortly this morning. The committee has also taken the decision to focus on challenges being faced by women in business, focusing on how best to support the economic participation of women and the growth of women-led businesses, how to improve the collection of data and how to incentivise recruitment at senior level. We anticipate the establishment of a women's business centre and we have consistently highlighted this issue in our budget analysis. So in closing, I will mention two pieces of work that we are currently focusing on. We recently launched an inquiry into a just transition with a focus on the Grangemouth area. We plan to look at how best to support, incentivise and de-risk the just transition in a way that benefits both companies and individuals. Our other work stream is looking at the disability employment gap and what must be done to ensure the government meets its target to significantly reduce that gap. While disabled people are often furthest from the workplace, they not only deserve to be included in our workplaces and our society, but with the right support, they have a really valuable contribution to make to our economy. So in closing, I would like to um, thank everyone for coming along today. Uh, I hope the forum will provide you with an opportunity to make new connections and exchange ideas and experiences, and I look forward to hearing from our other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. We will now hear from Andrew Murphy, Chief Operating Officer for John Lewis Partnership. Andrew has held a number of positions in the John Lewis Partnership and is noted for his role in establishing John Lewis as one of the UK's leading omni-channel retailers. Andrew is also chair of the Scottish Government's Retail Industry Leadership Group, a member of the Bank of England's Central Bank Digital Currency Engagement Forum, 
and the former chair of the Scottish Retail Consortium, Andrew. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, First Minister, Presiding Officer. It's my privilege to be here to speak to you today, although I'm slightly terrified now that my LinkedIn has been read out in public like that. It doesn't sound nearly as good when it's uh, in the Scottish Parliament. Um, it's a fantastic turnout, and uh, I think that's testament to the importance that I hope everybody in this room uh, attaches to public and private sector working together. Um, and perhaps also to our shared recognition of the need and our responsibility to make our collaboration even more productive in future and over the next 10 years. As mentioned, I'm speaking to you today in my capacity as co-chair of the Scottish in, uh, Retail Industry Leadership Group, which I lead uh, alongside Minister Tom Arthur. But I'm also speaking to you today equally as a proud Scot as the product of Pennycook High School and the University of Aberdeen. I'm speaking to you as the father of three boys who are currently working their way through our country's state-funded secondary and further education systems. I'm speaking to you, slightly more randomly, as a football fan and a former player and youth team coach who still gets more excited about the right result from Parkhead on a Saturday than he does about the results in the boardroom at the end of the year. I'm speaking to you as the son of Margaret, who's uh, in South Queensferry and whose 75th birthday will be celebrating there tomorrow night in a new local restaurant that's part of a fantastic growing Scottish chain. Why do I introduce myself like that? It's because there can be no sensible conversation about commercial enterprise or about business people without acknowledging that business and society are interlinked. Moreover, it's vital that we accept that the jobs we each do don't wholly define us and that they can't be allowed to create barriers of prejudice and assumption which could hamper or overly define our interaction with each other. And I think today, days like today are really essential in making sure that we engage as humans on the level. We're one society and with absolutely no political inference intended, we can and I believe should think of ourselves as members of Team Scotland. But at the same time, we can recognise and feel great about the fact that within this, we each have different and vital roles to play for other teams, some of which legitimately claim precedence in our passions and our energies as we think about the future, our family, our business, our industry, our cause, our party. For me, as for all other business people here in the room and across Scotland, my role is to serve our customers and to ensure profitable trade and to exercise a duty of care to our employees. But we all take great satisfaction and pride from the fact that if we do these things well, we also add social, structural and economic value to Scottish society. So when you listen to my thoughts in the next 10 minutes and my suggestions, I'd like you to hear them not just as the concerns and urgings of Andrew the businessman, but of Andrew the dad, Andrew the son and Andrew the product and grateful beneficiary of Scottish society, of someone who through, who through both legitimate self-interest and collective concern wants only the best for Scotland as together we look to create its future. So, the question is, how do we maximise the opportunities of the next decade? So, first, some disclaimers. Honestly, in 15 minutes, I can't do justice to such a broad and fundamental question across the full scope of Scottish industry. Secondly, for my five recommendations to make sense, I actually need to spend more time setting context than I do articulating the suggestions themselves. But please bear with me. I promise the speech is only just over 10 minutes long. And thirdly, I am going to talk most specifically about retail, but I hope I'm going to be able to make it clear, and I do believe it's in the most part, where those points also have relevance to Scottish industry as a whole. But I am particularly pleased to have the opportunity to put retail centre stage because of the huge role it plays in the lives 
of Scottish people and all the communities in which we trade. Retail provides most people's first conscious experience of what a business is. And later in life, it offers flexible, high quality employment at multiple different levels of experience and seniority within easy geographic reach of ordinary people. And that is not to be underestimated. One way or another, retail is integrated into the life of every Scot. 230,000 Scots employed in the industry. £20 million raised or donated to Scottish good causes in 2022. Hundreds of millions of customer interactions every year. But it's precisely because retail is so ubiquitous, so relied upon, and has always been part of our everyday lives, that means it's sometimes thought of like a public service. Other times, it's the victim of nostalgia, prompting people to want to see it preserved in aspic rather than evolve as it must. I have endless fond recollections of my own childhood experiences in retail, in Willie Lowe's, in Goldberg's, in Arnott's, in Vinyl Villains. I sold them some brilliant records for 20 quid. They were worth about 500. I think I'm scarred by that. <laughs> but sentimentality gets in the way of us focusing on retail's existential challenges of today and generating the sense of urgency with which we have to collectively address them. Retail can't be taken for granted. It can't be assumed to be an all-enduring, on-demand utility that's certain to adapt, certain to always be able to rise to society's needs and any challenge. Our industry needs support and realism, and more than anything, it needs influence in order to flourish and, in fact, survive. Even before the pandemic, we'd seen many good retailers go to the wall, with retail insolvencies steadily increasing through the end of the last decade gouging a deep scar through the heart of many of Scotland's towns and cities. The reasons for this are usually more nuanced than the media headlines will show. Those tend to assume sales decline or the idea that a brand has simply chronically lost popularity. Now, while of course those things can and do happen, very often the fatality is actually the result of a business with a perfectly healthy customer franchise and a decent sales line but which simply can no longer endure a relentless increase in its core costs, or arrives at a moment of truth where a significant investment is required one-off, either for regulation or to update assets or to digitise part of its operating model. The hard reality for the UK retail industry as a whole is that its pre-tax profits have halved over the past decade. Now, if that surprises you, there is a simple equation to explain that. And it's an equation that is not going to change. On the left-hand side, UK population growth, consumption increase per person, and price inflation, despite what's happened in the last 12 months. And that left-hand side will remain significantly smaller than the right-hand side, which is underlying cost growth in labour, in cost of goods, and in the cost of defensive digitisation. Why do I say defensive digitisation? It's because retail literally is the distribution and the sale of goods produced by others. The role of the retail sector in the economy, this part of the value chain, is to enable producers and manufacturers to reach consumers. But the internet has changed this game forever. For all its many positive impacts in commerce and society, in consumer-facing industries especially, we nonetheless have to respond to the fire that the internet has set under the platform on which many of these existing businesses were first built. An example of this is where non-food retailers are being disintermediated by both the product brands who reach the customer now directly through their own website and also by technology giants like Google, Amazon and Facebook who are the first point of entry for most people when accessing the internet. Now I mention all of this not in a search for sympathy but simply to help everybody understand why many of the store closures that you see are happening and that they're not always evidence of a failing business. More often, they're simply evidence of shops being a less effective and often now unprofitable distribution channel for that business. The harsh reality is that neither the consumer nor the manufacturer of goods needs retailers now quite like they once did. And consequently, neither of those groups are prepared to pay the same price, the retailer's margin, 
that they once did. And that price is necessary to support our former mode of operation, our previous scale of physical presence and our labour intensity. And no one should therefore be surprised that retailers are having to engage in previously unimaginable transformations of that scale, their physical representation and their staffing in order to survive. So how do we together deliver the conditions to support retail's transformation and survival and by doing so contribute to maximising the entire commercial sector's performance in the next decade? Five things. First of all, let's agree that in a small country like Scotland, there can be no true sustainable success for any of us without at least a measure of success for all of us. Consequently, I firmly believe that tomorrow's successful, sustainable businesses will be those that not only have a great product and service, but also have an embedded purpose. The purpose of the John Lewis Partnership is to work in partnership for a happier world. Starting in 1929, our founder progressively passed his ownership of the business to the people who worked in it. So a sense of the common good and of purpose is intrinsic for us. It's most recently seen in our Building Happier Futures campaign to employ, develop and nurture care experienced people. I was also delighted to serve on the Scottish Business Purpose Commission, whose report was warmly welcomed by government. And that's unsurprising, because purpose drives many of the Scottish Government's priorities, most notably perhaps on fair work. It's really difficult to disagree with the underlying intent of fair work and the idea that most companies and society would benefit from businesses progressively shifting their focus along the axis from the short-term interest of shareholders to their broader stakeholder group, employees, suppliers, customers, community, the planet as a whole. The majority of businesses I speak to already align with this sentiment and are taking action. Secondly, we need to not be shy about the fact that the existential priority for any business is the need to be commercially and economically successful. And because of that, I put it to you that it's imperative that everybody who sits in this chamber now or on any other day of the week becomes enthused by the idea of profit and of wealth creation. Consider for a moment the investments driving us towards net zero, a potential area of alignment or a potential area of tension. In and of themselves, investing in energy efficient lighting or in vehicles powered by hydrogen or electricity can be a financially positive and a returning investment, quite apart from being beneficial for the planet. That's brilliant. But the timescale over which these financial returns materialise can be anything up to 10 years. So if the profits from the core operation of a business are not likely to be healthy in the meantime, that investment, however ultimately valuable, can't be started, far less sustained. We trade in real time. We pay our employees and our bills in real time. And so many businesses simply can't survive if we're obliged to make major investments which remain cash negative for prolonged periods of time. There's no glory or benefit for anyone when a business dies. That the business might die with a handsome array of sustainability initiatives and investments to its name doesn't soften the blow one bit. It's incumbent on all of us in this room to ensure we avoid permitting such a self-defeating scenario which would be the opposite of the Team Scotland approach that I described. My final point on profit is that not only do businesses and their employees rely on making a profit, wider society relies on it too. Not just in taxes, but perhaps the best illustration most directly is to note that local government pension schemes are able to support their members through retirement as a result of investing in funds containing mainly corporate bonds and equities business and society intrinsically linked. Profit and purpose are the blood and the soul of a healthy business and a healthy society. Third, in order to take this country and its industries forward, we have to share a clear vision and strategy between policymakers and industry. The National Strategy for Economic Transformation, industry leadership groups and the ILG Chairs Roundtable are exactly the right platforms for which this from which this collaboration can grow but they have to be used in the right way 
and we all have to have the discipline and resolve never to sidestep them or compromise them. Building from that and forth, we have to accept that it's usually only on the journey to delivering a strategy that we really discover whether, when we've done the work, we've truly managed to reconcile the differences in view about the ideas or about what they will mean in practice. Will those strategies be strong and specific enough mandates to hold firm when buffeted by unexpected events and external challenges? If not, can we be collaborative, constructive and adaptable to change once on the road? This applies very much to retail for the reasons I've described and our journey ahead. But many Scottish industries have similar paths to tread where traditional modes of business must be carefully managed along an evolutionary path. A path on which many of the jobs and the physical infrastructure associated with the past will ultimately have to make way for different skills and different me uh, delivery mechanisms of the future. What is vital here is that Parliament and Government recognise that industries constantly face their own market-driven and rapidly emerging, often non-discretionary, changes. This means that politicians should expect to be open to compromise uh, in the sequence of actions and the pace of change that they might most ideally like to see for legislative and policy-driven change. It is vital, therefore, for the success of both groups, Parliament and business, that businesses are engaged and listened to at source on the targets, the schemes and the practical delivery plans, and not just when the high-level national strategies are sketched. This requires consultation models and industry partnerships, which are always on at the highest levels. And the ILGs clearly have the potential and the desire to provide this. But they'll only do so if they become the first touch point for all new ideas, initiatives and exploratory intent flowing between government and industry. This is not to displace the vital role of business representative groups, whose leaders inevitably make up much of the ILG membership, but it's simply to ensure that government and sector leadership are jointly and simultaneously cited on all emergent issues and can help each other through that process. There are a couple of recent issues in which that collaboration has sadly not been the default. And I can't help but think how differently the aims of the deposit return scheme could have been delivered if we'd worked from the start in that collaborative way. Or if there were meaningful and ambitious action in response to the long-held and widespread industry concerns about the effectiveness of the UK apprenticeship levy. Finally, but perhaps most fundamental, is that all of the strategic and operational partnership for which I've asked has to be built on trust. I firmly trust that the Scottish Government has good intent for the people and the industries it represents and that it is genuinely determined to be a home for successful commercial enterprise, both large and small. But I see across colleagues in industry how the faith that they have in politicians' good intent can be quickly undermined by instances of intransigence or when confronted by what appears to be insufficient attention to the detail of successful delivery. To avoid this, we need to be closer from earlier, more curious about opposing views and less quick to judge and entrench on both sides. So in conclusion, my presence here today and the speech I've delivered speak to the fact that I believe the priorities of industry and the Scottish Parliament, of business people and politicians, are naturally and fundamentally aligned. As members of a relatively small and highly interconnected society in Scotland, we naturally share many of the same aspirations and concerns. Where we sometimes drift apart, I think, is in relying slightly too much on the high-level aspiration and frameworks, but neglecting to refine and give a sharp edge to that natural alignment through a rough stoning process of reconciling, ultimately, some different needs into highly specific plans, timescales and outcomes. To our collective cost and frustration, when this happens, the detail of execution becomes the ruin of the dream. In the next 10 years, to ensure the successful Scotland that we all want, let's dream and do the detail of delivery together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you.
Thank you. Yes, <laughs> not quite yet. This is now your opportunity to put questions to Andrew. Um, for those who are joining us online, can I ask if you'd like to put a question, please send it in via the online website Slido. For those here in the chamber, please raise a hand um, and then we will ensure that your microphone is put on. For those who are able and comfortable, please do stand and if you could give your name and organisation. And if I could have the microphone on in the second row here, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Can if you hear me? If you'd like to stand, thank you very oh, much. Um, I'm quite an unusual character and I didn't want to come today because I'm too busy. Okay, so I was talking to this young lady that I met and I said, I'm very nervous about coming because I don't do public speaking. Um, I don't have a single qualification. I left the school at 15 and I wanted to ask Andrew, how did you start your business? Um, well, did you do it personally? No, no, no. I, um, did you I... have a full education to learn how to run a business that size? I had a full education, but no, no education about uh, business. A footballer business. would help, I would think. Well, I started, um, I'm from Jasby Wilson, down at Dolbeete, and the first, I'd really like to thank the government for the help they've given me um, for our business. It really has made a massive difference. Um, Scottish Enterprise supported us for years. <coughs> they recognised the potential that our little business had. And they took me by the hand and led me to where I am. But that was Scottish Enterprise, and I was worried when it went to Sosi. Very worried. I went and watched Russell Griggs to begin with, and I thought, private sector's really going to suffer here. But I went to a few, and I actually met him, and, and he's quite an exceptional guy. So we're in safe hands down there. And I really would like to thank Russell for what he's done for us. I would like to thank Phil Robinson, who has left the public sector because he was disillusioned and he was put under so much pressure. But he now works full time for us and he's an incredible guy. You would learn a lot from Phil Robinson, Nicola a lot. Now, <clears throat> moving on from there, you must have heard of Jasper P. Wilson, surely. Well, we have done so many things down there. If you did, everybody did what we are doing, Scotland would be great again. But the problem is all the money goes in the public sector, right? If you want this to be successful, you need to get behind the private sector. Manufact we manufacture Jesus, we're losing money doing it, even with the help we get from you guys. We're trying to train people. We're paying for it ourselves. We've tried to kind of get it up here for you to see what should be done. But n nobody seems to want to know us because we are the private sector. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, to come in at this point because I'm aware of, of, of other interest and perhaps you'd like to, to address the points made there. Thank you. Um, First of all, I think anybody who starts their own business and makes a success of it has uh, my unending respect. Um, I did it a completely different way. My first job was in Dalmore Paper Mill, uh, sadly now defunct, then uh, RBS. I jinxed that too. Uh, <laughs> so, so, then, so then I went and finished my education and uh, then uh, I managed 30 years in a big business where um, I think what I would say to everybody is the great thing about a big business is you don't just learn about it, you actually learn about yourself and you figure out what you're good at and what you're interested in and what other people's response to, to you is. But um, every time I speak, speak to a, a person who's kind of built and in, uh, kind of ensured the survival of their own business, it's a story of challenge and of, you know, quite a lot of um, chance and luck. And uh, I mean, as, as to the, kind of one of the points in my speech, um, public and private sector, it's very easy to stand apart, but we all know, particularly I think, and Scotland's just a perfect example because it's so small, it's, we have to be together and we have to be interconnected. And that, that's why I've given 20 years of my time to, um, to business interest in engaging with local and national government because it's never perfect, it's never easy, and short term it's rarely the most productive thing, but long term it's the only, only sensible way to, to be. Yeah, one more quick question. 
we educate our own apprentices down there, and we've been highly successful, highly successful. Numerous people have come and seen us, but we have never been thanked once for it. That's my only gripe, everything else that we've been helped with. But we have invested an awful lot of our own money in this, and we've got 20 apprentices. And I'm sorry, but we've not had the support that we should have. I notice there's more I'm on the DYW board, and I notice you're all trying. But you need to come out and talk to the private sector. I've come in from the jungle fighting, fighting for my life, back to the town to see, listen to you lot in your cosy seats here. I'm at the front line fight, fight, uh, fighting for my life. Okay, thank you. You need to get behind the private sector. That's going to fix things. Thank you. If you'd like to respond. Um, look, I think uh, when uh, the purpose of days like today is exactly so politicians can hear from the reality of business, I think you've done that really, really well. And I'm, I have a feeling that you'll be, you'll be hearing from people as a result of that. So thank, thank, and well done for speaking up. We've been, we've been kept quiet. I think we're too successful on our own. If you want to get, make Scotland great, you come and see what we do in our business. I wake up every morning and try to make the world better. Thank you. That's my goal. I'll take another question. Um, if I can have the, the microphone on, um, just the, the third row here on the right. Mm. Thank you. Hello. Um, my my name is uh, Pete Moforth. I come, come from a private company called Endes. We're an e-commerce company based in Glasgow. I've spoken here before and I'm I can only sort of say more or less what I've said before. I, I really welcome the, um, uh, what's been said this morning about a joining together of um, knowledge and information between the public sector and the private sector. That is going to be so key. And um, from my own position, I see lots of small Scottish businesses that we work with that have fantastic entrepreneurs behind them that are keen and motivated with great ideas. They often don't have a problem with, with money or financial resources. The problem they have is a lack of skills. And the point about as retail in the modern world, which is increasingly electronic, increasingly online, is that there is a crying need for these new generation of uh, skills that only really exist within the private sector, within industry. And at the moment, we have a skills provision system that operates largely within the public sector through colleges and universities that don't really supply the information that's, that's needed to train these new people. The skills lie and reside within the private sector, and we need to have some framework, some mechanism for, for this transfer of skills. And I'm not aware, given, given that most retail organisations are SMEs in, in, in Scotland, um, they simply don't know who to go to when they're trying to grow and develop their businesses. They have everything in place, they just don't have the skills. So is there some way that as a result of event, fantastic events like, like this, that bring together these, these, these two sides of things, where we could inter interact and actually share some information and find a way to get the skills from business into these new startups. Thank you. Um, as it happened yesterday afternoon in a committee room quite near here, the um, industry, leader group, industry leadership group chairs met, um, including some time with um, Minister McKee, and skills was the, the primary issue uh, uh, on, the, on the table. Um, lots of sentiment expressed similar to your own um, about a shared desire and a shared recognition that without an uh, enlightened and strategically anchored uh, focus on skills development in Scotland, whichever industry you're from, you're, you're going to underpotentialise. Um, if I just take retail, for example, um, we have 230,000 people in the industry at the moment. Um, I don't know what the number will be in five years, but it will be less than that. And that's a natural evolution now for our industry. But we will be effectively donating to the skills pool. Uh, and my encouragement to, uh, to government, but also to, to everybody in this room, is that we have to think about the country moving up the value chain. And when we retrain, we must retrain for the far future that's emerging. Um, so, for example, in, in retail, as it's digitised, what you've seen is more jobs as delivery drivers more jobs in contact centres um, because the service is now delivered over the phone. And that's been good for Scotland, actually. That's, that's, there's a lot of jobs there. Sadly, those jobs, those jobs are going to be replaced by technology. And so we must get up to the higher end of the food chain, to AI development, uh, to, to tech support, 
because if not, our country will be disintermediated, not, not just the retail industry. But I am really confident that um, all the right eyes are focused on this issue. Do we have any further questions? Yes. Um, if I can have a, a microphone to the fifth row. Thank you. Um, please do stand if you're able. Hello. Good morning. My name is Bronwyn Thomas. I'm from Women's Enterprise Scotland. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about how large retailers can do more to support women business owners. Um, there's a huge untapped potential out there and at Women's Enterprise Scotland we do everything that we can to support women to start up and thrive in business. Um, I think it's, uh, we're living through a time where um, every big business that I'm aware of has to make a choice about where it focuses its, its energy. And it, uh, for the biggest businesses, we can focus our energy in a number of places, but we can't focus our energy everywhere. You probably know the John Lewis Partnership um, has a board that is majority made up of women. It's ethnically diverse. Um, our chairman, um, Dame Sharon White, is, is, is very well known, and you can bet that she has a very significant focus on uh, concerns around uh, both gender and ethnic diversity. But ultimately, um, we will achieve more by being more focused and businesses also have to be meritocratic about where they provide their uh, patronage to suppliers, about how they build their supply chains. And um, I, would, I would like to think that as we move forward, um, we'll see all the support that you would expect being given both to businesses led by, by women, but businesses that are, <clears throat> like the one that we heard about earlier, that are out there fighting, generating good value, customer service and great product. So if there are specifics, as the Chair of the Industry Leadership Group for Retail, we'd love to hear about, about that, um, because it's a conversation that we are due to have but haven't had yet. So perhaps you could reach out to me after this event and we could take, on, take the conversation offline. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Um, we will have to conclude questions to Andrew at this point, but of course there will be other opportunities during the day. And I would now like to invite the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP First Minister, to address the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and let me add my welcome to the Presiding Officers, to all of you, uh, for being here and joining us today for these really important discussions. Uh, this is a very different perspective on uh, the Scottish Parliament Chamber uh, than the one I am used to uh, from my seat over there. Um, it's a much nicer perspective, I have to tell you, but I, I mean no disrespect to my colleagues when I say that. Um, thank you, Andy, for uh, setting the scene for us so well uh, today and for being here uh, with us. Please wish your mum a happy birthday from all of us uh, when you see her tomorrow. When you spoke about Arnott's and, and Goldberg's and, and William Lowe's, I felt as if you were taking me on a trip through my teenage years. Uh, but what you had to say about retail, uh, I thought was profoundly interesting, um, but also made me reflect uh, not just on the challenges for retail, but the way in which the challenges that retail is facing right now uh, are reflected across the economy. When I think back to my uh, younger years and listening to Andy, it you know, crystallised in my mind just how important retail was, not as a means to an end, but actually in our lives more generally. For me, the, the Riverside Mall in Irvine uh, was not just a, a place where we went to do essential shopping, not just a source of employment, but uh, a meeting place, uh, a social hub, a place of human interaction. And the challenges that the internet poses for retail that, uh, as you say, must be faced up to, uh, in a way that allows the value of retail to be preserved, and I don't just mean monetary value, those challenges, but also opportunities, are replicated elsewhere. So I think your comments today uh, were extremely instructive uh, and give us lots to, to think about over the course of these discussions this morning. Uh, so thank you for your contribution. I'll, I'll maybe touch on uh, all of the questions that were posed to Andy as I go through my remarks this morning. Um, I hope you will hear over the course of uh, our discussions this morning a real commitment uh, to the private sector and a recognition that the country can't succeed. Andy made this point very powerfully. The country can't succeed and won't succeed without a thriving, growing, uh, prosperous private sector. 
and the relationship and the engagement, the collaboration, the joint working between the the private and the public sector is essential to that uh, and I hope you uh, hear lots uh, this morning that will reassure you. Uh, thank you for uh, a one a one man <laughs> applause but uh, you might not you might not want to to applaud this next bit uh, but whether you like it or not I'm about to invite myself to visit your business um, so that I can see for myself what you do and, and thank you in person for the work you're doing <laughs> in apprenticeship. <laughs> Trust me Trust me, as long as it's a colour that suits, I'm happy to wear a boiler suit. Anyway, I think I'm going to move on because this could become just a, a conversation between the two of us and I'm not sure I would prevail in that conversation. Uh, the, the final point I would make for somebody who claims, and I'm stressing that word claims, to have no experience of public speaking, um, I think you could teach politicians a thing or two from what we heard earlier on. I'm going to move on now if it is okay. But I think the, the interaction that we've already had this morning, I do think underlines just how important events like this are. It's now almost 20 years since this Business and Parliament event was, was first established and it has lasted so long and I think thrived over the course of these years because it meets an enduring need and we've already heard that expressed here this morning. And that is for businesses to contribute perspectives and insight and at times challenge and criticism to legislators and policy makers. Now, obviously, this isn't the only event that enables that to happen, but I think it is an extremely important one. Um, and it's welcome that we've got MSPs from across all parties, I think, uh, here today, uh, as well as me. I think we have six other government ministers here today to listen to the discussions and the challenge that will be posed. And obviously, we've got representatives uh, from a broad and very uh, diverse array of businesses here too. And as Claire said in her opening remarks, it's really good to be back in person after a, an interval of three years, albeit joined online by others today. And I think this event and the discussions that it enables is particularly important right now. Uh, the theme of today's uh, discussion, of course, is maximising opportunities for the next 10 years. And it's important, particularly at times uh, like this, and I'll come back to that in a second, that we do have opportunities to lift our eyes beyond the immediate day-to-day -day pressures and think about what kind of economy and therefore what kind of country are we seeking to create in the years to come. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think it is important to address and to acknowledge, first of all, that for many businesses, if not for all businesses across our economy right now, this is an exceptionally difficult time. Uh, costs are rising and they're rising at a time when, because of the wider inflationary crisis, consumer confidence is also low. And of course, we are still in a process of recovery from uh, the biggest shock uh, that most of us have experienced in our lifetimes, a global pandemic. Uh, and earlier in the week, of course, in a, a projection that was very much echoed yesterday by the Bank of England, the IMF forecast that uniquely amongst developed countries, the UK economy is likely to shrink in 2023. Now, there's many factors that play uh, in that, but of course, uh, the situation has been exacerbated by impacts of Brexit, which include an issue that's already been touched on this morning, uh, the constraints on the supply of labour, which is affecting virtually every sector across our economy right now. So that's the context in which we meet today. But I think it's really important that as we recognise and acknowledge that, we do lift our sights and lift our eyes and that we are ambitious for the future for taking advantage of the many opportunities we have. It's incumbent on the Scottish Government to do everything we can to support businesses during uh, this difficult period and to listen today to suggestions about what more we can do to support business. Uh, our budget for the coming financial year uh, went through the first stage of its legislative process yesterday led by the Deputy First Minister. And just as one example of the way in which we are seeking to support the private sector, in that budget is a commitment to freeze the poundage 
for business rates, which was the key request made by business organisations ahead of our budget. That freeze will ensure that Scotland continues to have the lowest poundage rate in the UK, and it's part of a package of business rate uh, release that is worth almost three quarters of a billion pounds every year. Uh, so that's just one of many examples of how we are seeking to support the private sector. But of course, it is important that we continue to engage and listen and that together we consider and work out the best ways in which to provide that support. Of course, and I'm not particularly seeking to make a, a political point here, it's a statement of fact, we don't have in this parliament access to the whole suite of fiscal levers that we would uh, need to provide much fuller support. So we also need to see action from the UK government across a whole range of issues relevant to helping business now cope with the short-term pressures, but also to help lay the foundation for the future. But let me repeat, because this is the focus of my remarks today, the job of my government is to use uh, all of the powers we do have at our disposal to support businesses now and to maximise opportunities, going back to the theme of our discussion, for the longer term. It's almost a year now since we published the National Strategy for Economic transformation. Uh, I don't have time, I'm sure it will relieve all of you to hear this this morning, to talk about every aspect of that strategy. But I want to highlight three particular points uh, in that strategy. The first is uh, that, and I've heard uh, Andy refer to this in his remarks already this morning, uh, that well-being and fairness alongside productivity and economic dynamism is really important and that is very much at the heart of that strategy. Uh, I think it is now widely and indeed increasingly acknowledged that these two things, fairness, well-being and economic dynamism, productivity, are not aims that are in contradiction to each other. In fact, they reinforce each other. And in fact, that's not new thinking, particularly in Scotland, we should reflect that was uh, very much at the heart of much of the work of Adam Smith back in the, the mid 18th century. But it is thinking that is being reinvigorated now. Um, and that is why there is in our strategy for economic transformation, a strong emphasis on fair work, because we recognize that uh, as many businesses already do, that workers that are empowered and valued are more likely to contribute to the success and the productivity of the businesses that they work in. Uh, so the strategy is intended to be a blueprint for a stronger economy, but by creating a stronger economy, also uh, a blueprint for a better society. And the second point I want to make is linked to that, and that is about the, the importance of entrepreneurialism. This chamber right now is full of entrepreneurs and innovators. And of course, that's something uh, that Scotland's uh, reputation down the ages has been very much founded on uh, entrepreneurialism, enterprise, innovation. Again, something that we need to reinvigorate and make it the driver of our future success. Indeed, sir, look, I'm happy to take, sir, Thank for the you. interest of everybody else, I'm happy to take questions from you at the end, okay? But if you let me just finish my remarks, we'll probably uh, get through this a lot better. And when I come to visit your company, you can grill me to your heart's content. Okay, sir, I'd ask you just to, for the, or I'm going to set the presiding officer on you, and believe me, <laughs> she can be fierce as I experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I know, sir, but I'm, I'm just asking you to respect everybody else as well, um, and then you can ask me questions later on. Um, but that commitment to entrepreneurialism is why we have appointed uh, Mark Logan, uh, formerly of Skyscanner, as the Scottish Government's Chief Entrepreneurial Officer. And that's about putting expertise and experience at the heart of government. I've spent more time than I ever would have wanted to dealing with Chief Medical Officers uh, over the past 
couple of years. But what that's told me is the vital importance of having expertise at the heart of government. I know the Enterprise and Fair Work Committee took evidence uh, three weeks ago from Mark, and he said this, which I think is really important. It goes to the point the gentleman has just made. If we're to have a thriving population of individuals who have fulfilling lives, we need to be starting things more often than we have been doing. And that basic ambition of being a nation where people start new businesses more frequently is, I think, central to our prospects for growth over the next decade. Whether those businesses are tech firms with global ambitions or social enterprises that are finding new ways of benefiting local communities. Um, and it's to help support that uh, that Mark has been appointed. It's why we're investing in the new Tech Scalers Network, providing tech entrepreneurs with some of the best support anywhere in Europe and reasonably soon that support network will become available to entrepreneurs in other sectors as well. Uh, and of course we need to encourage more people to think about being entrepreneurs, uh, to think about setting up uh, their businesses. Anna Stewart's review of women in enterprise going to the question that was uh, posed a moment ago is going to be published soon and is important in that regard. Uh, and why is that important? Right now, only a fifth of new enterprises are founded by women. So if we can change that, if we can encourage a situation where the rate of uh, businesses being started up by women is even broadly equivalent uh, to the rate that men start up businesses, then we're going to have a significant impact on the bottom line of our economy. Uh, so encouraging more enterprise and entrepreneurialism will also help us seize new market opportunities, which is the final point I want to touch on this morning. Just a couple of days ago, I uh, visited Spire Global in Glasgow. Uh, Spire designs and manufactures satellites, and it's one of the companies that is right now putting Glasgow and Scotland absolutely at the forefront of the space sector. Uh, Glasgow currently makes more uh, small satellites than any other city in Europe. Uh, so it's an outstanding example of our strengths in space, in advanced manufacturing, and in the linkages to other sectors that that opens up. And the national strategy highlights, and this is where I think we do need to lift our eyes and, and be optimistic, it highlights many other sectors in which we are already a global leader food and drink, tourism, life sciences, financial services, and it sets out some of the key ways in which we need to support these sectors uh, to grow, particularly to internationalise and to acquire the skills that they need. Possibly the biggest opportunity ahead of us right now, one that I know the Enterprise uh, Committee has taken a strong interest in, is the transition to net zero. If I talk just about the Scotland project, our offshore wind opportunity, uh, alone, if we play our cards right, and that's a big caveat because we've got to take the decisions that make sure we realise this potential. But if we do that, that has the potential to deliver not just green renewable energy for the future, but £28 billion of supply chain work in the years ahead. So that incredible offshore wind potential we have, as that comes to fruition, it will enable economic activity, the creation of jobs. It will also enable uh, the creation of a new green hydrogen energy sector, perhaps the biggest industrial opportunity we've had in Scotland since the discovery of North Sea oil and gas. And we know decarbonisation can create many jobs in other sectors as well. It's often seen as a, a big challenge and burden, and it is difficult, but the opportunities are potentially limitless. Just before Christmas, I opened DSM's new factory in Ayrshire. Uh, that is providing a food additive for livestock, which will reduce methane emissions in agriculture. Really important to uh, us meeting our net zero ambitions, but that additive will be exported across the world. And of course, at a time of high energy costs, the importance of helping and supporting all businesses to reduce their carbon emissions is clearer than ever. So fundamentally, that move to net zero, yes, it's an environmental and moral imperative, but it is also possibly the biggest economic opportunity of our lifetime. So government has a responsibility to support business, to support the private sector uh, in seizing those opportunities. And as we do that, and this is the point I will conclude on, uh, we know that we do need to work closely with business, with the private sector 
generally. And we know that's not just a matter of holding meetings and discussions or even events like this one. Engagement must have real impact and it must be two-way. It goes in both directions. Uh, we're seeking to improve that engagement. We've appointed private sector leaders onto the delivery board for the national strategy. Perhaps governments everywhere uh, give too much emphasis to devising strategies and too little emphasis to delivering those strategies. We're seeking to address that in how we take forward uh, the economic transformation strategy. Uh, as I've already alluded to, we've brought business perspective into the heart of government through the appointment of individuals like Mark. Uh, we've set up a new liaison group for key economic sectors, uh, the chair's group of the industry leadership groups that, that Andy has already spoken about. I met with uh, members of that group in Butte House last night. We had some good discussions there. And to go to the question uh, that was posed about skills, and as Andy said, that was one of the key discussions. Uh, the shortage of skills, the need to upskill, uh, reskill our population is a pressing one. That involves discussion and engagement between business and government, but it also involves businesses in different sectors being more collaborative and working together uh, to solve that challenge. Uh, we also set up, and this I think is important, and it goes to business being involved in the design of policy, a new regulatory task force at the end of last year to ensure that when new regulations are needed, as unfortunately sometimes they are, we work with business to understand uh, their impact and where we can to mitigate that impact. I know that task force also met yesterday. So that engagement and collaboration, that genuine joint working is so important and it is what makes this gathering so important. It's not uh, the only one, but it is a crucial one. And all these years after the Business in Parliament event was established, I think it is today more important than it has ever been. As I said at the outset, these are tough times and there is no point in trying to uh, overlook that. But we can and should still look to the future with optimism. This country has many hugely successful businesses. We have a strong international reputation and that is obvious to me every time I travel overseas uh, to promote the country. We have important world leading strengths in key sectors. So by working together in the way that we are talking about here uh, today, we can build on those strengths. We can certainly address current challenges, but I believe we can with real optimism uh, set ourselves the challenge and deliver on that challenge of maximising the opportunities of the next decade. So thank you uh, very much for listening. I'm very happy now to take a few questions and I'm not going to bother uh, losing money by putting bets on who the first questioner is going to be. <clears throat> Thank you, First Minister. We have a, a question in the second row here on the right. If we could have that microphone on. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. My name is Caroline Miller um, from Scottish Agritourism. I'm a farmer from Angus. I represent entrepreneurial farmers who are trying to sell food direct and um, run tourism businesses on their farm. Many of us are women who are sustaining the family farm and employing people in the rural communities. You mentioned COVID. Um, that's been a difficult um, couple of years for everybody. Also inflation and things that we can't control, economic impacts from around the world. Um, I welcome what you're saying about working with business much earlier in developing policy, because what I would say now is that, you know, we have these really entrepreneurial farmers who are trying to um, grow businesses on their farms, set up new farm um, agritourism experiences. But just now, there's a whole range of policies coming against us at once. Short-term lets, deposit return scheme, new planning. And it, you talk about wellness, people's wellness, being an entrepreneur and trying to get started and trying to grow your business. It feels like we've got COVID, things that we can't control, and then a barrage of government policies. And if we are more involved at the start in understanding the modelling of how that impacts entrepreneurs. It would make us feel much better and be able to grow our businesses instead of putting people off. I think that's, I, I think that's a fair challenge to, to me and to government, and I'll, I'll accept that challenge. It's not easy, um, but 
that doesn't mean we shouldn't really work hard to uh, deliver what we're talking about here, not just engagement. Look, I've, I've been in government now for uh, a long time, and I will stand in here with what now 6, 15, 16 years of experience in government readily concede that too often governments, not just this government, but governments everywhere, engagement, and not just with business, but generally, can be a bit of a tick box exercise if, if we don't pay real attention to uh, the impact of engagement. And, and the earlier, the better. I'm going to say something else that might be controversial, and, and it's not, you know, this will not be true 100 per cent of the time. I'll, I'll enter that caveat. Most of the time when governments are doing things, regulating legislation, introducing new policies, we're doing it for a reason and a purpose. And more often than not, that is either a good reason or an inescapable reason. So we're not just dreaming up things to make life difficult for people, even although I'm sure that's how it seems sometimes. So we need to better explain why certain changes or, or regulations or legislation is necessary. And then we need to listen to business about, OK, if you have to do this, here's how you do it in a way that doesn't make it sort of unnecessarily difficult for us and, and what we are doing. Now, that is a, a challenge to government, and I think we've got to rise to that. If I can throw the challenge back to, to business and to business organisations, that can be challenging for you as well, because that sometimes means not just entering a conversation from the point of opposition, like we don't want this end of story, but listening to why it's necessary and then engaging in how we shape things. So it actually poses challenges for all of us. And governments inevitably at times will still have to do things even if you don't agree with them. And, 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 and so we will not necessarily always agree. But that ongoing day to day, Andy, I think, used the phrase, you know, that engagement's always got to be on. And I think that's important. So I take that challenge uh, and take that away. And uh, we will work hard at trying to make sure we put it into practice. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question, as I'm aware there are other sessions to, to get to. And I'm going to go to the back row here on the left. Thank you, Stephen Thompson, Jackie Thompson. Uh, fish processing in Musselburgh. Um, thanks for taking my question. It's something that I never thought I would ever do, is speak in the Scottish Parliament. Um, just before I give two points, the first thing is to say we are very thankful, grateful for the um, support given by the Scottish Government through the Resilience Fund as processors who not only worked through the pandemic, but we actually increased our production through the pandemic so that people of Scotland could be fed. Um, secondly, I would just say the daily um, updates that you gave us, uh, Nicola, from the podium, I think was something that helped to keep staff at their jobs when they were particularly frightened and scared about working during the pandemic. So that's a personal thank you to you for what you did for business. The two simple points I'd like to make around employment, which I think is the biggest challenge for many of us as employers. We only employ 150 people, but it's a challenge. Um, recently, the, obviously, the national living wage has been announced, um, which is great. I welcome that. It's up to a level now. Well, it will be up to £10.40 or 41, something like that. But as food producers, we tend to be in the lower sector of, of paid employment. And so what I would ask the politicians to try and do with whatever uh, powers that you have is to always ensure, I know this is a soundbite, but always ensure that work pays. Because we've had people who are near to the bottom of the pay uh, structure and that uh, their work impacts with what benefits they can claim and as a result they fall out of labour, they fall out of work. And that is something that affects uh, food producers, particularly food, chicken, poultry, you know, people who are um, on the sort of a lower um, rungs, if you like, of the, the food chain, no pun intended. And the second thing was, because of the labour shortage, we've been looking into trying to um, work with a sponsorship scheme to bring in people from abroad. So at present, we've got a very nice chap working with us who's got licence to stay here in lieu of the fact that he's married to a, a UK national from Nepal. Uh, we've been trying to bring people over, but it's 
We are a type of company that would always follow the law and best practice. So by doing that, we simply cannot afford to bring people who want to work in Scotland, they want to live in Scotland and obviously therefore contribute to the tax take and all the rest of it, but they can't come in. I'll tell you for why. 25,600 is the minimum we have to pay them, plus the cost of getting them in, which makes it up to about 28, £29,000 per year. And they cannot work more than 48 hours a week. So you do the maths. For us, it doesn't work. If it was just slightly lower, then us and our colleagues in the North East, because what Andrew was saying was right about the fact that we need to work together with other businesses. We, we don't like to when we see other fishmongers closing because we're all in, in the same industry. But our colleagues in the North East who have seen lots of their staff leave to go back to Eastern Europe, they could benefit from that type of thing too if that threshold uh, was reduced. I'm, I'm sorry for taking too long. Thank you very much, sir, and, and thank you for your kind comments as well. They're uh, much appreciated. I, I agree with both of those points, and uh, they demonstrate, I, I think, two things. The importance of uh, thinking about unintended consequences in, in policy, something perhaps governments don't do enough, and making sure that, that the policies we are introducing have the, the desired effect. Uh, also highlight in many ways the split of responsibilities between this parliament and the parliament in London and the importance of us trying to work notwithstanding political disagreements in the same direction. So you've highlighted there the importance of two things. Firstly, because labour shortages and skill shortages, it doesn't matter the sector uh, I speak to, that issue is always at or near the top of the agenda at the moment. So firstly, we've got to maximise participation in the labour market from our own population, and there's more we can do there. That is about skilling, upskilling, reskilling, uh, supporting people into the workforce. And as you say, as we rightly try to raise... Uh, wages, particularly at the, the level of, of the living wage, uh, that we are not uh, putting people out or disincentivising uh, the, the work uh, for, for people. Now, that is one of the, the splits in responsibility because we don't control all of the rules around social security. We control more than we used to, but not all. Uh, so we need to, to think about that. But secondly, we need to ensure that we have the ability to attract people into the country. Um, and you know, that's, I, think, I think immigration generally is a good thing. It encourages different countries, cultures, faiths to better understand each other. Uh, diversity is a positive, but we've got a hard economic need to make it easier for people to come to the country. This parliament doesn't control immigration. Um, I think we should have greater control over immigration, but we spend a lot of time uh, trying to make the points you've just made to the UK government. So that particular one you've made, and it's one of many I could make, but the presiding officer will get uh, shirty with me, as she often does, because I go on too long. I'm not even looking at her just now because she'll be glaring at me. Um, this is one of the advantages of this position, presiding officer. I don't see your glaring uh, looks. Um, but that, the salary threshold, so I, I met the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago up in, in Inverness, that was one of the points I was making to him. Uh, the salary level uh, is too high um, and you know, we need to reflect average salaries in Scotland in order to make that, as well as taking away a lot of the other bureaucracy. So the points you make are well made and I can assure you where we can, we will take them into account in our policy making, but we'll continue to make these points to the UK government where appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. I'd like to thank delegates for the questions. We don't have time for more at the moment, but there will, of course, be opportunity for debate and discussion as the morning goes on. Um, before we break, can I ask all workshop co-chairs and speakers to remain in the chamber? Parliament staff will escort you to your relevant room. But can I just suggest that we thank the First Minister, um, Andrew Murphy, and all who have taken part in this morning's session. Thank you. Delegates are now invited to make your way to the garden lobby.